Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next in the series of NAI Team Overview Seminars. And this seminar is by a principal investigator who I think is well known to everybody, Vicki Meadows, uh, who has been a PI in the NAI since the second competition. I think most people also know the general subject of Vicki's team. As you know, I often point out that there are some teams whose entire research project can be captured in a sentence, and sometimes even half a sentence. In the case of Vicki's team, it's the audacious task of modeling an alien biosphere. So uh, we're going to hear about Vicki's progress and future plans on that. Uh, Vicki got her bachelor's from the University of New South Wales, which happens to be the home, the new home of our Australian uh, international partner, and the Australian Center for Astrobiology, led by Malcolm Walter. And then she got her PhD in astrophysics at the University of Sydney in Australia. She then moved to JPL, where I believe she uh, spent her entire career prior to moving to the University of Washington a couple of years ago. She was an NRC postdoc, a research scientist. She was at the CERTIF Science Center, and uh, then, of course, the, which got converted into the Spitzer Science Center. So without any further ado, Vicki, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Carl, for that introduction. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the Virtual Planetary Laboratory lead team of the NASA Astrobiology Institute and to inform you, my fellow NAI members, about uh, the research that we do. I'll give you an overview of the types of areas of research we like to get into, some of the major players, uh, some updates on some things we've done already um, as they illustrate what we're capable of, and a discussion of our future plans as well. So uh, as Kyle pointed out, it can be fairly easy to summarize what we do and our area of research. We are firmly centered in exoplanet science. Uh, but in doing that, uh, we also have to call upon our colleagues in Earth observing science and also in the early Earth community, because both the modern day Earth and the early Earth are examples of habitable and inhabited planets. So we care about those as well. So um, I'm talking today, but behind me there is a mass of people. Um, I've actually lost count of uh, how many <laughs> we have. It's something close to 40. Um, but so when I show uh, lists of our, our team here, I, I tend to talk in statistics rather than individuals because I can't really go through everybody individually. This is slide one of two. Uh, and so what you can see here statistically is that we have a very strong center now at the University of Washington. Myself, postdocs, graduate students, and we just recently acquired our colleagues from the original UW team. So people like Roger Buick, Peter Ward, John Barris, Jody Deming um, are all now collaborating with the VPL as well, and I'm very, very pleased to have them join us. Uh, we have another major center, of course, at JPL and Caltech, which is where uh, VPL started out. We have had a very, very strong collaboration over the years with Penn State via Jim Casting and his research group. And that really has been, uh, as you will see, extremely valuable in shaping the type of research that we do as well. Uh, if I move to page two, we also have collaborations with NASA Ames uh, in both uh, planetary atmospheric modeling uh, and chemical modeling, and also in microbiology uh, as well for microbial mass. Tori Holler, Kelly Decker, uh, Dave Demeray there. We have some links with Goddard now through their Earth observing people, Watson Greg, Jeff Peddlety. And then you can see we also have a list of experts distributed uh, across this country and other people's countries uh, who help us out with the various tasks as well. So we're distributed very highly uh, across about 20 institutions with about 40 people, but centered primarily at, at three NASA centers and uh, at Penn State and the UW. So that's our team. Oh, and sorry, just one other point I want to make is if you're looking at this right-hand column, you'll see that we have an extreme diversity of disciplines in this team as well. Everything from stellar astrophysics all the way down to microbial, uh, for exa example, horizontal gene transfer or people who study uh, molecular evolution. All right, so uh, if you could say what our science was in VPL, it is the search for habitable environments and life beyond the solar system. That's where we want to work. Um, in uh, current uh, wisdom, habitable planets are more likely to be terrestrial planets, and they're more likely to be within this thing we call the circumstellar habitable zone. So that's kind of where we uh, put a lot of our research. We model in that particular area. Uh, currently, as of this morning, there are 344 extrasolar planets known. 
But of those, only about 10 are less than 10 Earth masses. And so that would be only about 10 that are probably terrestrial rocky type planets uh, more akin to the Earth than to Jupiter. All the other, terrest uh, all the other uh, extrasolar planets found so far are more of the Jovian type. And though we can learn quite a bit from them, especially in the techniques we use to study them, uh, it can be, uh, we, we think that the habitable ones are more likely to be the terrestrial planets, and so that's what we concentrate on there. So far in the extrasolar planet sample that we have, a true Earth analog has yet to be found, but it won't be long. I really don't think uh, it will be very long at all. So maybe in the next five years or so, we'll actually find a true Earth analog, which will be something, maybe two or three Earth masses in the habitable zone of its parent star. So the question we ask ourselves at VPL is once we find this thing, how do we go about recognizing if an extrasolar terrestrial planet can or does support life? So those are the questions of habitability and life beyond our solar system. Now, in our own solar system, we have examples of terrestrial planets, so we might think we know what we're talking about when we talk about terrestrial planets. But as our colleague here on the VPL, two of them, in fact, uh, Sean Raymond and uh, Tom Quinn, working with Jonathan Lunin, uh, have shown is that planets and planetary systems can come in a very wide range of uh, characteristics. And what we're showing here in this multicolored plot are just a whole series of simulations forming planets. And what we see is that planets can form at different sizes, different water abundances, different distances. And so we expect to see that kind of diversity in the extrasolar planet population. So we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we go about understanding this potential diversity given that we really only have three terrestrial planets with atmospheres in our own planetary system. And so the answer to that really is to go into the modeling arena. Uh, we do take observations as well, but again, as I said, we still don't have the sensitivity to get down to the true Earth analogs yet, even though we hope we will at some point. So if you want to learn more about extrasolar planets, as I said, we, we attack this via modeling, but you can also try and go out and take observations. And so this is where we tie very strongly into NASA missions, and that is that our work will be relevant to both the Kepler mission and the terrestrial planet finder missions, which I'll talk about in a moment. So Kepler successfully launched last month, which was fantastic news, and it is a mission that will stare at the sky uh, non-stop for about four years, monitoring the brightness of stars to check for planets that are passing in front of their parent star. When the planet passes in front of the star, it causes the light from the planet to dim. So uh, we're able to pick up these planets, and this instrument should be able to find true Earth analogs, in fact, Earth-mass planets in Earth-like Earth orbits around their parent stars. So we're very much looking forward to the results that will come from that mission. The other mission that VPL is potentially relevant to are the concept missions of the terrestrial planet finders. Uh, they have a counterpart, a sister uh, mission concept in Europe, uh, the Darwin ESA mission. But someday, we hope, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, to fly very, very powerful, very large telescopes that will be able to detect light from extrasolar terrestrial planets, so Earth-sized things, and actually take that light and break it into uh, a spectrum so that we can look at and analyze the environments and to search for possible signs of life on extrasolar terrestrial planets. However, there's a challenge to understanding an extrasolar terrestrial planet, and that is because even with these incredibly powerful telescopes, all that we will see will be a pale blue dot, essentially, or a pale blue pixel, as I've, I've shown graphically here. So um, when we try and learn about extrasolar terrestrial planets, we'll come up across a bunch of problems. One is that, of course, our solar system only contains a subset of possible planets, so we really have to think about other possibilities. Everything we learn about the planet will be from this disk average data, so everything we want to know about its environment and whether or not it has life in it is contained in this blue pixel. And we have to, from that blue pixel and the spectrum that we get from it, disentangle all the characteristics of the planet, whether or not uh, the planet has oceans, continents, uh, and, in fact, a biosphere. And we also have to forget, that, uh, not to forget, that clouds and dense atmospheres will limit our view at certain wavelengths. So it's also important to try and figure out where in the spectrum of a planet you might be best able to see what's going on. So in a nutshell, what VPL does is our science is a search for habitable environments and life beyond the solar system. Our approach is to use self-consistent models of planetary environments and to generate spectra from those self-consistent environments. Our input uh, to the models, because we can't just make this up out of thin air, even though you know theoreticians have a tendency to want to do that, but we try to keep ourselves honest by having input from field and laboratory work, uh, from planetary observations of planets in our own system and extrasolar planets, and also to gather constraints from the geological and biological records. 
So in many ways, this is where the rest of the NAI comes in. You can help to keep us honest by doing the work that you would do, uh, but just keeping in the back of your mind when you discover something, think, hey, I wonder if the VPL could use this. Because anything you can learn about um, uh, microbial life, uh, metabolisms, the gases that are given off, uh, and also constraints from the geological and biological records can, in fact, help us with our modeling effort. And so our output then are models um, that allow us to provide improved understanding of past environments that cannot yet be directly observed. Um, so the early Earth as well as extrasolar terrestrial planet environments. And from that, we generate synthetic planetary spectra and look at the detectability of existing and novel biosignatures as an aid to these very large telescopes that will one day be designed and flown to look for these sorts of things. So that was the VPL, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by uh, signs of life, looking for them on extrasolar planets, before I launch into what we're actually doing in our individual tasks. So this is just a little bit of background science to help you understand what comes afterwards. So when we're talking about recognizing whether a dim, distant, pale blue dot is a habitable planet, there's a number of things that we can do astronomically uh, to do that. One is we can look at the planetary system environmental characteristics. So what that means is, are there other planets in the system? Can we learn something about uh, the planet we're looking at, its mass and orbital parameters, and its interaction with the other planets in the system to understand whether or not it could potentially be habitable? And so to do this, we need uh, what we call dynamicists, people who actually understand the evolution of planetary orbits and can look at the interaction, the gravitational interaction between planets in a particular system. And so the VPL has dynamicists on board as well to do that. We can also look at the photometric characteristics of the planet. And by photometry, we just mean to measure light. So we're just looking at the brightness of the planet in different colors. Uh, and what I'll show today is, is what you can learn from that using a, a specific example of looking at the Earth. Uh, and, but, of course, the most powerful way of determining what an environment is like over a great distance will be through spectra, using spectroscopy, taking the light from the parent object, breaking up its, into its constituent wavelengths, and looking for signatures from the surface and the atmosphere of the planet, and potentially from its biosphere. And ultimately, all of these techniques I've described are observational techniques, but the other thing we're going to need to be able to interpret and to recognize whether or not our planet is habitable are, in fact, models. And one of the, the, I guess, the starkest examples of this is, is the holy grail of habitability. When we talk about a habitable extrasolar planet, we would like to see liquid water on the surface of that planet. And uh, in fact, uh, to be able to have liquid water, you need certain surface conditions, including a surface temperature above the freezing point of water. And that may be very difficult to directly observe. It turns out that being able to measure a temperature from a planet, you don't necessarily get the surface temperature. You get, you get a temperature up somewhere in the atmosphere. And so to be able to figure out the greenhouse warming that affects the actual surface temperature of the planet, you will need climate models uh, to be able to do that. So even in this very basic of all measurements, what's the surface temperature like? Could this thing be habitable? We will need both models and observations. So I'm just going to show you a few terrestrial planet spectra just very quickly, just to give you a feel for the type of things that we're talking about. Uh, these are model spectra of Venus, Earth, and Mars. And I just want you to see that you know, the Earth spectrum looks quite different to the Venus and Mars spectra. It has a lot more wiggles, a lot more activity going on. Uh, we can see a lot more greenhouse gases um, actually in its spectrum overall, even though we can see that Venus and Mars are dominated by CO2. Uh, but these are the sorts of things we're talking about looking for, looking at these spectra and seeing whether we can pull out greenhouse gases and signs of life. On the Earth, of course, abundant oxygen is a sign of life, and we see that at 0 0.76 microns there uh, down in the, in the shortwood end in the Earth spectrum. You can also look in the mid-infrared, and so these terrestrial planet finder missions have been postulated to fly with telescopic capability in both the visible and the mid-infrared, or one or the other. Uh, but in the mid-infrared, we start to look at uh, very valuable things like carbon dioxide, a very powerful greenhouse gas, even present on the Earth, so even on a habitable planet, we can pick that up there. Ozone, again, another uh, proxy signature for life, and also an ultraviolet shield on the planet. And then we can also see uh, at the shortwood end of the uh, mid-infrared and that blue spectrum of the Earth, things like methane and nitrous oxide. So we start to get biosignatures from alternative metabolisms other than oxygenic photosynthesis turning up there. So what are the global signs of life? We talked about what we can look at to look for habitability. Um, you know, using photometry, we can search to see whether there's uh, indications of an ocean on the planet. Using spectra, we can look for greenhouse gases uh, and trying to understand the surface temperature. But through all of this, we want to try and understand whether or not we can pick up signs of life. 
So I'm going to introduce the concept of astronomical biosignatures. We've had a lot of talks already from team members about in, what we call in-situ biosignatures, where, where you can take a lump of rock and look for sterols and other things that may be indications of life in the rock. Astronomical biosignatures, we have to try and determine if life exists over a distance of 10 parsecs. And so what we're looking for are global scale photometric, spectral, or temporal features, so time-varying features, that are indicative of life. And we know from observing the Earth that life can, in fact, provide a global scale modification of our atmosphere, our surface, and our appearance over time. So we sort of divide biosignatures in these three different types of categories. Just like in situ biosignatures, though, these astronomical biosignatures must always be identified in the context of the planetary environment. So we have to understand what the environment's like to be able to uh, figure out whether we have uh, a, a true biosignature or just some product, some equilibrium product of a, of a non-biological uh, environment. So for example, the difference between Earth methane and Titan methane. Earth methane is seen in the presence of oxygen. Uh, so there are known sinks for both of these gases on this planet, and they're seen very strongly out of, dis out of equilibrium in what we call chemical disequilibrium. That is indicative of a sign of life, whereas on Titan, for example, the methane uh, and ammonia we see there are really uh, characteristic of, of what the planet formed with and are not considered to be signs of life. I also want to just introduce the concept of anti-biosignatures, which is something I think that Dave Demeray first came up with, but this idea of a free lunch uh, that in fact, we can also look for anti-biosignatures, signs on a planet that there are abundant gases around that really life would have jumped on immediately if it possibly could. And I know Yuck Young often talks about this as the floating $20 bills. So we're, we can also potentially look for things that are built up in an atmosphere that would normally be consumed by life uh, to let us know that potentially life is not there. So looking again spectroscopically at these things, the signs of life in an atmosphere would be things like the simultaneous presence of oxygen or ozone, its proxy, and methane and nitrous oxide. I'm also showing just some habitability markers here, CO2 and water. Um, when you're talking about atmospheric biosignatures, you really uh, are looking at three different processes, and this is something we have to worry about in, in VPL. To have a good atmospheric biosignature or to define one or recognize one, you need to know that there's a biological source for it, so we care about what metabolisms are putting out. You need to understand its atmospheric lifetime uh, on the planet, so how long it hangs around in the atmosphere. The longer it hangs around, the more of it builds up, the more likely we are to see it. That atmospheric lifetime is a function of the interaction of the planet with its parent star, as well as the planetary processes themselves, because a lot of photochemistry is stellar driven. So we do also have to understand a lot about what stars are like, um, sorry, and I'll just get back. The other thing is that the biosignature should produce a spectral feature. Um, and that isn't always a given. And when we fly these telescopes, we may have fairly limited wavelength ranges in which to work in. So we always have to care, too, about what the impact of this gas is on the spectrum of the planet and whether or not we would have the capability to see it. So we talk about oxygenic photosynthesis. That is sort of the, the classic... Um, metabolism that is considered to have biosignatures that we can look for, things like oxygen and ozone. But at VPL, we're also concerned about other potential biosignatures, things like methane, uh, things like methyl chloride, nitrous oxide, which we can get from various sources. Even ammonia, in certain instances, can be a biosignature. We care about other methylated compounds. And ultimately, again, here's where we turn to you and say, hey, please advise us if you have you know, an interesting metabolism that you think might uh, alter the atmosphere in particular, um, that's, that's something we would really like to know about from our fellow team members. So that was atmospheric biosignatures. The other biosignatures we can think of are the surface biosignatures. The most characteristic one is something called red edge. Uh, and this is a rise in reflectivity, longwood of about 0.7 microns um, in vegetation, which is due to a combination of chlorophyll absorption and a change in the scattering properties of the leaf structure. Uh, and that uh, is what Landsat uses, for example, uh, from, from orbit to determine that the Brazilian rainforest is disappearing. It uses a ratio between that rise and the chlorophyll absorption to tell where vegetation is underneath. It turns out we could potentially use that um, on an extrasolar uh, planet to look for vegetation signatures. The only problem with looking for a vegetation signature in the disk average of a planet is that the vegetation itself may take up a very small fraction of the surface of the planet, and so that signature may be swamped by other characteristics of the planet, including clouds in particular, which both uh, reflect a lot of visible radiation, providing, uh, making it much more difficult to see the vegetation, and of course also physically cover the vegetation up. So what we have here is a simulation from the VPL that we've done in the past 
just looking at the disk average spectrum of the Earth when you see different views on the Earth, and I'm going to attempt to use the cursor here, um, but, oops, we'll quit, quit flash. Okay, I'm trying to center over the Pacific here. Um, Yep, close enough. So uh, what we're looking at here is if you look at the red spectrum on this plot, this is actually a spectrum of the disk averaged uh, Pacific Earth. And you can see that there's very little rise uh, in radiation between that uh, blue area and the pink area. Whereas if you look at the green line, for example, uh, which is showing you uh, the area of the Americas and over Brazil, you can see a very sharp rise, a very sharp um, difference between uh, the radiation seen uh, here for the, for, the, uh, for the Pacific and here when we go over Brazil. Now, we were cheating here. This is one of our three-dimensional models. We took all the clouds away, so we showed you the maximum effect of uh, the red edge, even in the disk average. If we add the clouds back in, that effect drops to about a 1 or 2% effect, making it quite difficult to observe. Not impossible, but certainly one of the more challenging biosignatures for an extrasolar planet. The other type of biosignature we're concerned with is temporal variability. Uh, so how things change on the planet as a function of seasons and whether or not that is indicative of life processes. And here is an example. We actually show the annual variation in carbon dioxide and the ominous decadal rise in carbon dioxide uh, over time. So these, these bumps and wiggles you're seeing are, in fact, the changes in CO2. Now, CO2 can be produced by volcanoes, which is an abiotic process, but you don't normally expect volcanoes to be seasonal. So we could monitor a planet over time to try and see if any of these particular gases that are potentially produced by metabolism uh, modify with seasons. So I'm now going to start talking about what the VPL does. Um, that was an overview of biosignatures. But uh, essentially at the heart of what we do is we, we take models um, that can be used to describe planetary environments, and also we use models that are used for planet formation or to describe the evolution of chemistry in a protoplanetary disk, so we go back that far. Um, but, but principally what we use are models of extrasolar um, planet environments that take into account photochemistry and climate on that particular planet. So climate tells us about the temperature uh, and pressure distribution within the atmosphere, and the photochemical models tell us about the vertical distribution of gases in the atmosphere. And we can couple these two models together so that they can talk to each other and come to a self-consistent equilibrium so that the gases in the atmosphere and the temperature and pressure are all consistent with each other, and we're not creating you know, uh, what I call Frankenstein planets, where you just pop things together and hope that all the bits and pieces will actually stick and hold. Uh, in this case, we really do allow these things to interact with each other, come to equilibrium, and give us something where, for example, warming in the stratosphere is governed by how much ozone is actually there, for example. So we used a couple climate chemical models, um, and then once we have our, our atmosphere, uh, and by the way, we can also lose gases out of the top, and we can feed uh, fluxes of gases into the bottom of the atmosphere via the surface from either volcanic or biological processes. Once we have these models uh, in equilibrium and we have, or close, as close to equilibrium as one can get in this kind of situation, uh, we can then produce uh, spectra of them and have a look at what they look like also around stars of different spectral type. So we can take our, our uh, planet, in this case we often take the Earth, we take out our G star, throw that away, replace it with an F star, it's a hotter star than the Earth, or an M star, a much cooler star, and look at how the radiation coming from the star interacts with the photochemistry and the climate of that planet uh, to tell us what kind of an end result uh, of atmosphere we would have, and ultimately how does that change the detectability of certain things we would normally take for granted, like ozone, um, for example. And I guess what we're showing down in this, this plot here, if I can move my cursor without the whiplash, here we go. Uh, down in this plot here, the spectra, uh, this was one case where we actually took an Earth-like planet, put it around an F-star, and discovered that, in fact, ozone was less detectable, even though we had produced more of it. And that was due to an interaction between the actual temperature structure in the atmosphere and the amount of ozone available. And that was not an intuitive result, but only through the modeling we discovered that, oh, yes, with more ozone, it's actually less detectable. So the VPL4D, which is our second incarnation, um, really is built around a series of nested models. These coupled climate chemical models, the fluxes that feed into them from the bottom of the atmosphere and the loss uh, from the top of the atmosphere. We have what we call an abiotic planet model, which doesn't have a biosphere in it, where we really concern ourselves more with the habitability of the planet uh, without life on it. And then we have a suite of models which fall under the living planet model, where we actually have a biosphere interacting with the environment. 
And in all of these, we also need stellar spectra as input and also um, information on molecular uh, characteristics. So uh, absorption coefficients, where something absorbs, how strongly it absorbs in the atmosphere. And it's just in the lab. So our research objectives are to characterize habitability and biosignatures for an Earth-like planet, to understand the climate and biosignatures of the Earth through time, because again, that's an example of a habitable planet that's actually inhabited, uh, to look at extrasolar terrestrial planet environments with the, the key to looking at the limits of habitability and also to concern ourselves with the generation of false positives, signatures that come from an abiotic planet that might mimic the signs of life that we think we understand. We look at the impact of life on terrestrial planet environments and the detectability of biosignatures. And ultimately, at the end of it, because we want this work to be relevant to TPF and other planet detection and characterization missions, we look at what we need to actually characterize extrasolar terrestrial planets, the required measurements we might have to make, and the data analysis that we would have to do. So those objectives map onto uh, five basic tasks, the Earth through a year, the Earth through time, the abiotic planet, and the living planet. Uh, and they all feed through this thing called the observer, which is our modeling system that allows us to transform our scientific results into something that might be useful to telescope planners. So I'm going to go through the tasks now in the second half of this talk. Um, our first task is the Earth through a year. So again, we want to understand biosignatures. Best place to go really is the planet that has them. Uh, and so when we initially envisaged this task, it was just VPL alone, but um, since we've been funded, Another mission uh, was funded, and that is the EPOC uh, reuse of the Deep Impact spacecraft, which is actually observing the Earth from space. So we now have a very strong collaboration between VPL and the EPOC, which is now epoxy uh, science team, uh, to use the VPL models to analyze the data that's coming from this uh, spacecraft observing the Earth. So in this task, we use three-dimensional spatially and spatially resolved models of the Earth. So we can take the Earth uh, and, in fact, simulate what it would look like spectroscopically uh, by feeding in actual Earth ob observations on a given day uh, and using a radiative transfer model to generate spectra of the, of the planet. Uh, we've been doing upgrades on that particular model, which we um, brought over from our first round uh, as the VPL. So we are, have upgraded it to use um, an ocean reflectance model, Cox-Monk model, to simulate sun glint on the, on the Earth. We're in the process of putting in polarization capability as well, because people are now thinking about polarization biosignatures um, for extrasolar planets. Uh, our grad student here, Ty Robinson, has expanded the surface spatial resolution, providing us with more land surfaces, so this is a better model. And all of this really is driven by trying to validate uh, the model against the epoxy data. Uh, we've been improving optical properties for carbon dioxide, methane, and oxygen. Uh, because we need those to simulate what we see from the Earth, but they're also important for our modeling overall for terrestrial planets. And uh, Javier at uh, JPL has been working on adding non-LTE to our radiative transfer model as well, so we can actually do aurorae and other processes and better understand some of the things that drive atmospheric escape. So all of these additions to the model, um, in fact, impact other tasks that we're working on as well. So in the Earth through a year, the current components are involved this model validation of the epoxy data, uh, I want to say that the epoxy data set uh, is very nice. We've used the epoxy spacecraft from a distance of about 0.3 AU and closer to look at the Earth and get time-resolved multi-wave band photometry, to get uh, disc hemispherically average near-infrared spectroscopy, so I can search for those um, time-dependent uh, signatures of, of variability in methane and, and CO2 over seasons. We have seasonal observations. We have the Earth observed in several seasons. We have both equatorial and polar views now of the planet. And we were able to, as you can see in this graphic, luckily, uh, serendipitously, pick up a lunar transit of the moon across the Earth. So we can also study a terrestrial planet undergoing its own transit. Um, so at the moment, we are, are using these data sets to model and understand uh, the detectability of, of things like ocean glint. That would be a direct way of detecting whether or not a planet has liquid water on its surface to look at surface types uh, and to look at the seasonal gas variations, how well we can pick these different characteristics out of the planet. So here's just to give you an example of, of some of the data sets we have. So these are observations taken by epoxy. Uh, and this mission, by the way, is PI'd by Drake Deming um, out of Goddard. And uh, so what we have here are uh, light curves. Actually, So this is the brightness of the planet over time and a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, team members working here at, uh, at the UW have actually taken those light curves and used a principal component analysis to pull out two what we call eigenvectors two characteristic spectra 
that if we take these two spectra and just add them together in components seem to uh, explain a lot of the behavior we see in the light curves at different wavelengths. And the two eigenspectra that we pulled out with no a priori knowledge of, of what we were looking at, we have to keep forgetting we're looking at the Earth, um, actually produce spectra that look very characteristic of an ocean and of land surfaces. So you can see in the top plot there, the blue curve is an ocean curve, the red one is land surfaces, uh, and below it are actual spectra of oceans and land surfaces in red and blue. So you can see that the eigenspectra we picked out were pretty characteristic. And so what we're able to do is having picked those out, we can then do this map that you see um, down below the actual Earth projection here, this map, um, which actually tells us when we see more ocean uh, and more land uh, on this planet. And what we can point out here, which I think was very exciting, is that we actually do, uh, we are able to map the position of the Atlantic and the Pacific just using time-resolved photometry. So this is an example of the sort of capability when we have either data or models looking at the detectability of these things, even if the, all we have is this, this disk average light curve of the planet, the disk average photometry. Okay, um, so our, our future work um, is looking at the Earth through a year. Uh, this uh, graphic down here just shows an example of the, the, v, the actual VPL Earth model output for 450 nanometers, so we can create artificial views of the Earth on a given day. Uh, we actually fed into this Earth model uh, data, I think this is MODIS and AIRS uh, cloud information. And for comparison, you can see the epoxy observation taken on the same day at the same wavelength. We're not quite getting the clouds right at the moment, and we're working on better understanding how we're using our input data and uh, just improving our model overall with its sensitivity. So this is what we're planning to do in the future with this. Um, we would like to actually model the Earth through an entire year's orbit and use that essentially as a laboratory, um, a set of data sets to help understand how detectable some of these characteristics are in the presence of realistic clouds. So looking at atmospheric biosignatures or red edge biosignatures uh, in that particular case, and also looking at how effective we are with different types of temporal sampling from the telescope um, at being able to pull out uh, some of these biosignatures on the Earth. And we've also been talking with the Venus Express folks who also have observations of the Earth taken from a very great distance uh, to help them out with their analysis as well using the VPL Earth model. So that's the Earth. So if we move on to task B, the Earth through time. Um, so here again, we care about the Earth through time because uh, for 50% of the Earth's history, we didn't have um, oxygenic photosynthesis dominating uh, the, the atmospheric composition of this planet. We had other biospheres and other potential biosignatures. And in trying to understand those with the existing geological and biological records, we can potentially get a handle on what we might see on planets that have not yet evolved uh, and gone through um, an, an oxygen rise event as the Earth did. So the Earth through time, again, combining couple climate and atmospheric chemistry models, we're also adding ocean models as well in this round, and we hope to get out the climate and disk average spectra of terrestrial planets at several stages of evolution. So um, what we do here, we couple the climate chemistry, ocean, and ecosystem models. We get our constraints from geological and biological records. We are interested overall, even though we haven't modeled all of these environments yet, but we hope to. We're interested in the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, the Carboniferous, in snowball events, and also looking at the future Earth, what that would look like as well. Uh, and from that, we hope to get spectra of terrestrial planets at different stages of development. So our current projects are looking at the effects of enhanced volcanic sulfur gases. We kind of have a sulfur uh, focus at the moment on both early Mars and early Earth. We're looking at methane greenhouses in the Archean, trying to warm the early Earth and trying to understand what kept this planet habitable um, over that time. Uh, we also look at the haze implications for sulfur MIF in the Archean, um, to, to look at the behavior of sulfur MIF with haze in place. Uh, some of our colleagues here at the UW are working on, on actual using geological constraints to get Archean atmospheric pressure, which will be very exciting if that uh, pans out, so we're looking forward to those results. Um, we have people modeling microbial mats, um, and also uh, at Caltech, Yuk Jung and John Bergengren are working on Earth's ecological sensitivity through the 21st century, um, looking at the rise of carbon dioxide and climate change overall. So our future projects include finishing off pretty much all of the above, uh, and also looking at the rise of oxygen with time-dependent photochemical models, um, developing a coupled atmosphere-ocean model for the Archean, um, which is, I think, being led at the moment by Sean, Sean Goldman, uh, with Mark Clare and also Watson, Greg, Greg at Goddard and uh, Kevin Zanley at Ames involved uh, in that too. 
and also team members looking at methanogen productivity for the Archean and other collaboration between Ames, UW, and Penn State on that one. So I'm just going to go through a specific example here of what we do for the early Earth. Um, so this is, this is work that has been done, but it demonstrates very nicely how we can use models um, to help understand the environment in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the context of um, geological and biological constraints as well. So this interplay between what we can learn from the field and the modeling efforts. So uh, this group, uh, led by Jacob Huck, Misra, and also um, Sean, on some aspects of this, Sean Domagul goldman um, So this is a collaboration between VPL and Penn State. Uh, looking at prior um, to the rise of oxygen, we know that the early Earth appears to have been ice-free, even though the astronomers tell us that the sun was much, much fainter at that time. So people have been trying to warm the early Earth. This study looked at uh, novel things to warm the early Earth, methane, which may be considered to be maybe not so novel, but also things like ethane uh, and higher hydrocarbons, and also looking at the effect of adding these sorts of hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. Sure, you get greenhouse warming, but you may also potentially produce a haze, and what happens when you produce haze on this type of planet? So haze formation can occur for a methane to CO2 ratio of about one or less. Uh, if the haze is thin, it provides a very nice UV shield. It may, in fact, affect your, your sulfur myth signature. Uh, but if the haze is very thick, it produces an anti-greenhouse effect by shielding the surface of the planet uh, from incoming sunlight. And so that actually cools your planet rather than warming it. So there is this interplay between adding your greenhouse gases and trying to avoid the formation of a thick haze for warming. Since the haze thickness will actually depend on methanogen activity on the early Earth uh, and CO2 levels, it's possible that the uh, Archean haze is also mediated by life. So that was another focus of this um, exploration. This project uses climate models bounded by geological constraints on atmospheric composition. Sorry, it uses photochemistry models as well uh, and temperature uh, to better constrain conditions on the early Earth. So this is kind of a, a case example. So just to show you some of the results from this, um, these are plots of surface temperature versus CO2 uh, pressure. What we're trying to do is get above this blue line. This blue line is freezing. Uh, so we would like you know, our results uh, to be somewhere above this blue line, and we would also like them, if possible, to be to the left of this paleosol data line because this is kind of the, um, the hard limit for uh, the amount of CO2 that we think is in the atmosphere based on paleosol data. So if we uh, consider those constraints, then the results show that if you add methane into the atmosphere, you can really only get above the surface temperature of... of um, of freezing surface temperature and be consistent with the paleosol data for a relatively small part of that phase diagram. So methane may not be uh, the best solution on its own to this particular problem. So the other thing this team looked at was, well, okay, there are other hydrocarbons in the atmosphere that can also be potentially greenhouse gases. And this photochemical model is showing that, in fact, uh, ethane may be one of the most abundant of these gases. Uh, so this would be the next one to consider for greenhouse warming. So the team ran the models with both methane and ethane in, and in fact found that uh, they were able to get solutions over a larger range of the phase space that justified both the geological constraints and this not freezing on the surface requirement. However, there's a consequence to adding large amounts of methane and CO2 into your atmosphere, and that is the formation of haze. And so what this diagram shows uh, in the red line is if you just ignore haze production, then as you increase the methane to CO2 ratio, you end up with consistent warming of the surface of the atmosphere. That's why that red line continues to go up. However, in reality, reality looks a lot more like the blue line, and that is that as you increase the methane to CO2 uh, ratio, you in fact produce haze fairly rapidly after a uh, ratio of about 0.1, uh, and that haze overall will decrease the surface temperature, that's that blue dropping line, uh, and increase the extinction uh, of the of the haze, and that's the, the green line increasing. So even though you count on the, the greenhouse warming, if you get haze production, you end up with a net cooling uh, because of this anti-greenhouse effect. So if we now look at the solutions with methane, ethane, and the haze in place, it turns out that none of our potential solutions, those black lines, actually fall within that desirable region, uh, which means that uh, we really do have to invoke um, stretching the paleosol data, given the errors on that particular measurement, stretching it out uh, to, to higher limits. And if that were the case, then we could end up with, in fact, a self-consistent uh, solution with both uh, methane and CO2 as greenhouse gases with their attendant haze in place. But it does require that we don't take 
the sort of classic paleosol limit, but really push it to, to the, error, uh, the error limits of that particular measurement. So in summary, uh, for that particular effort, we found that water, CO2, and methane alone really can't easily warm the um, early Archean. Uh, we've looked at things like adding ethane. That seems to help, but maybe doesn't get us all the way. But, but the team has also realistically looked at the effects of adding CO2 and methane and the haze that gets produced um, and this potential anti-greenhouse effect. So we do require, if, if this mechanism is going to work, actually more than this paleosol limit of 0.03 bars of CO2. And ultimately, also looking at this problem, uh, the researchers realized that the climate stability in the Archean could have been maintained by the response of methanogen production to surface temperature. And so that's going to be the focus of a future effort as well uh, in this area, is looking into uh, quantifying methanogen production uh, overall to better understand that potential feedback in the early Archean. So that was task B with an example. Again, we're doing a lot there. I just showed one particular example of, of things that have been done. Um, so task C is what we call the habitable planet. So this is our abiotic planet model. Um, it doesn't include an explicit biosphere in it. It really is just us trying to understand how habitable planets form, how they might maintain habitability, uh, and looking at the kind of processes and interactions um, that occur on these types of planets. So ultimately, with this model, we hope to have a coupled climate photochemical model that will allow us to model um, planets of different type, not just Earth-like planets, to get us disk average spectral climate and to also explore the limits of the habitable zone for plausible extrasolar planets. The current projects uh, include habitable terrestrial planet formation and composition, which have been worked on by Sean Raymond, Monica Kress, and Rory Barnes. Uh, they're at Colorado, uh, San Jose State, and uh, University of Washington. Uh, warming early Mars, trying different types of gases to do that, uh, to get it habitable. Uh, looking at SO2 in early Mars, SO2 has been postulated as a way to warm early Mars, but um, more work needs to be done on the actual photochemical and climate consequences of adding SO2 to the atmosphere, which haven't been really fully modeled through, so we're looking at that. Uh, that's a DDF project, by the way, that was, was funded. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, habitable zone limits uh, as well. Uh, we're attacking that two ways. We're using three-dimensional models. And we're also starting out with one-dimensional models. And here we're really looking at the realistic effect of clouds and these hazes on the climate balance uh, of planets near the limits of the habitable zone. Um, and in addition to just looking at the radiative effects on the habitable zone, it turns out that for planets around M stars, the habitable zone, the reason where, region where they can keep uh, the liquid water on the surface, is very close to the parent star. And that means that the star starts to gravitationally interact with the planet in addition to radiatively interacting with the planet. So what that means is the star can actually transfer gravitational energy into tidal heating of the planet, the way Io gets heated by Jupiter, for example. Uh, and so you can, in fact, drive geology and geological cycles via gravitational interaction with the parent star. And we're looking at how that affects habitability also. Um, we also have these super-Earth environments that we're particularly interested in. Everybody's interested in super-Earths. These are the very largest of the Earth-like planets that have been found so far, so things at about eight uh, Earth masses. These are observationally things that are being found now and will be found and explored relatively soon. So we also would like to get into modeling super-Earth environments and trying to understand their composition, climate balance, and also potentially the, the geological activity associated with them. So future projects in this area are getting that 1D climate chemical model uh, working for super-Earths, led by Ty Robinson, and also 3D environmental modeling uh, as well, in, just in, in the general uh, area, getting generalized models for these two. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going, I'm sort of running out of time here, so I'm actually going to skip this a little bit. This is work done by Monica Crest, where she's actually working on how to get solid carbon into planets as they form, working on this concept of the soot line. She thinks PAHs are probably the most likely way that carbon gets incorporated into a forming planet, uh, and she is producing uh, disk chemistry models, which we show here, that actually show the evolution of these uh, constituents with radial distance from the center of the star in a planet forming disk. And we are combining these results with uh, Sean Raymond's planet formation models to actually get a much better idea of uh, the, the bulk composition of planets once they form in a particular simulation. So the combination of chemistry and planet formation models. Uh, the other thing we're looking at, problems with the inner solar system and accretion. Uh, Sean Raymond is trying to create Mars, but he's having trouble. Whenever he manages to get a Mars that is small enough, it uh, means he has to put some unrealistic constraints on the outer solar system, including uh, Jupiter's and Saturn's with eccentric orbits, 
uh, and uh, non-migrating bodies, meaning Neptune isn't allowed to migrate, which we know actually happened. Uh, but in the process, he's discovering that if he, if, he can, if he creates a Mars, he actually dries out the inner solar system. So again, we're trying to understand the delivery of volatiles and also just the creation of the own uh, planets in our own uh, planetary system. Another thing Sean is working on is models of how you create hot super-Earths. We've had some super-Earths discovered very, very close to their parent star. He's trying to figure out how they got there, whether they migrated there, got shepherded in by a giant planet, formed in situ. Uh, so his models have been used to then predict what these planets would be like, their composition, where you might find them, what kind of dynamical characteristics they would have uh, in those particular positions. And so he's come down with two uh, models that he think are the best ones for creating hot Earths, and they have observable consequences. So we're waiting for Corot and Kepler to maybe uh, look at these systems and tell us whether or not at least one of these models was right. So again, predictions with models. And this is just a, a quick diagram showing Rory Barnes's work on this tidally heated habitable zone, the concept that it's not just the radiation hitting the surface of the planet that's important, but also the gravitational energy being deposited. Um, and so he's looking uh, overall at when you can get enough heating from tidal heating to, to actually contribute to the habitability of the planet and when you get too much and actually drive um, the loss of habitability from the planet. Sip over that. Task D, the living planet. Um, in this particular one, we actually start using biospheres to understand the interaction between life and the environment. Uh, current and future projects, we're working on these. Um, the response of inhabited planet atmospheres to time-dependent stellar flare activity. So not only do we rip our sun out and replace it with an M-star, but we replace it with an M-star that is flaring massively, is, is, is undergoing uh, a rapid and violent release of ultraviolet uh, radiation, looking at how that, in fact, affects uh, the habitability of the surface. We've been looking at biosignatures from sulfur, biosignatures, sorry, sulfur biospheres in the Archean, trying to understand different metabolisms um, and not just sticking with our oxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, we've looked at the coevolution of photosynthetic life with the environment, and some people may remember this. This was a, a press release and also a Scientific American article on understanding the colors of planets, um, sorry, colors of plants on other planets. I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. And also lab work on the efficiency of photosynthesis and also development of land and ocean biospheric models. So I'm just going to go over each of these with one slide, just a little bit more detail. Uh, yes, and of course, our field modeling components. Uh, led by Pan Conrad at Svalbard and uh, Janet Seifert uh, to Quattro Cienegas. And I know that the Quattro Cienegas study is also in collaboration with ASU uh, as well. So there we look at the limits of habitability and also um, stromatolite, freshwater stromatolite growth in potassium deficient environments. Again, understanding these primitive life forms to see how they might impact our early Earth environments. So with the stellar flares and habitability, what we did was, again, we used our coupled climate chemical model, but we modified it to be able to take in time-dependent stellar forcings. So that meant we could change the spectrum of the star every 10 seconds, have that feed into the, uh, into the, the climate uh, chemistry model and look at the effect on the photochemistry of the planet as it was being bombarded by ultraviolet radiation from this star. So to do this project, we had to collaborate with real honest-to-goodness stellar astrophysicists who could tell us you know, what the spectrum of the star was like and how that evolved over time. And then we put that as input into our climate chemical model to look at the effects on temperature, ozone, column depth, and surface and UV flux. And what we found was actually kind of interesting. And that was that, in fact, even when we hit a planet with one of the worst flares that an M star can put out, um, about 10 to the 32 ergs, we got a less than 1% change in the overall ozone column depth. It was actually very um, robust to that um, during and after the flare. And in fact, you can see that over time, um, we in fact reached our equilibrium position after several months. So there really was a perturbation to the atmosphere over several months after the flare, but that was in fact uh, pretty small. It was at the less than 1% level. And even at the peak of the flare, uh, we got only twice the typical surface UV flux we see at the Earth, which is not too terrible, and it was predominantly in the UVA range, which is not um, as DNA damaging. And so, really, it wasn't that much of a deal, which we were, we were quite surprised at. But again, at least, we've, at least we've run through the models. Um, other things we've done is look at how biosignatures get enhanced when you have a star of different spectral type. Again, the, the different type of radiation coming into the top of the atmosphere affects the lifetime of different constituents. And what we're just showing you very quickly in this slide is that things like um, methane 
for example, can build up quite significantly if you have a planet around an M star. This is less methane. This is more methane over here. Uh, and these different colors are the different types of stars. You can also build up more nitrous oxide and more methyl chloride. But in fact, what's not too apparent here is a little bit subtle is that actually methane and methyl chloride had rapid increases in their lifetimes uh, due to the fact that um, ozone photolysis and oxygen photolysis was not going on as well. And those are the pathways to getting rid of methane and methyl chloride. So those weren't excited as much by the stellar spectrum. But the nitrous oxide was directly fertilized and it got hit much harder. It does have a longer lifetime, but it, it didn't um, enhance its lifetime anywhere near as much as the methane and methyl chloride did. So we're learning a little bit more about what can build up uh, in a planetary atmosphere. So here's a spectrum of, of the Earth versus uh, different planets. So a planet around AB Leo uh, with and without methyl chloride. And all I want you to see here is, in fact, the difference between the blue and the red lines, particularly in this region, is, in fact, absorption from methyl chloride. So that is another potential biosignature we could look for uh, on a planet around a cooler star. On the Earth, the methyl chloride lifetime is sufficiently short, given the UV radiation that's hitting our planet, that it doesn't build up uh, to detectable levels in the atmosphere around the Earth around a G star. But if you have an Earth around an M star, you start to be able to detect um, things that are really more trace in our own atmosphere. The other thing we looked at was also the buildup, again, of sulfur biosignatures on an early Earth type planet, but again around an M star. And what we're looking at here is the difference between the black and the red line here. Uh, this particular slope in the red is actually due to strong absorption from dimethyl disulfide uh, in the atmosphere of the planet from a sulfur biosphere. Um, so let's see. Co I'm, I'm, I'm ramping up here. Coevolution and detection of alien photosynthesis was something that Nancy Kiang led, which was, which was very exciting. Um, and this was uh, just looking at what type of radiation hits the surface of the planet. When we do our modeling, and we get our environments and we, we generate spectra of them. We generate the kind of spectra that would be coming off the top of the atmosphere of the planet, the sort of thing that a telescope would see. But as a byproduct of all of these models, we also generate the radiation that's actually hitting the surface of the planet, the sort of thing that a plant or a microbe would see looking up. So Nancy took this data. Uh, she looked at it for Earth-like planets around different types of stars, FGK and M stars. And she figured out that, in fact, there were some fundamental rules to where you might expect um, photosynthetic pigments to be. And so working on those rules, she was able to essentially predict what the colors of alien plants uh, would be. But one thing we discovered in this is, in fact, that the peak of chlorophyll A absorption occurs at the peak of photon flux incident on the surface of the planet. And that peak is at around 688 um, nanometers even though the peak of energy coming from the star is in the green, you probably all learned that you know, the most energy hitting the surface of the planet is in the green. That's true, but the most number of photons is actually in the red. And since photosynthesis is a photon-limited process, that's where our plants have decided they want to hang out uh, and get the photons. So using these sorts of rules, she was able to predict where you might expect to see photosynthetic pigments um, for planets, plants on other planets. Um, and she's continuing that work, by the way, also looking at what might drive the red edge, uh, too. The other thing Nancy's working on, this is another DDF uh, effort, again, thank you, Carl, um, is looking at the energetic limit for water splitting for photosynthesis. So what Nancy and her team are trying to do here is actually use photoacoustic measurements um, of a particular type of marine uh, bacterium, uh, cyanobacterium, that uses chlorophyll D rather than chlorophyll A preferentially because it hangs out on the underside of this particular creature, which I'm not even sure what it is. But um, it lives under there, and it tends to only get uh, sort of long wavelength far red infrared radiation in that environment. Uh, and so looking at the efficiency of that will help us understand if there really is a hard limit for water splitting photosynthesis, where that might be, and what the relevance would be for planets around stars that have long wavelength radiation that comes in, like M dwarf um, planets, and also on haze-covered planets like the early Earth, where you may be blocking a lot of visible radiation, but allowing radiation through in the near infrared, which is the sort of thing we see on Titan and um, Venus. Any planet with a very dense photochemical uh, haze has that characteristic. Uh, we're also working on biosphere models. We have a bunch of them up and running now, which is fantastic. Um, several of them are now coupled to GCMs as well, so we're starting to have the capability to play, play around with alien vegetation uh, and its interaction with um, a more Earth-like environment. Uh, we also have um, recently um, completed the EVE equilibrium, equilibrium Vegetation Ecology Model, which is 
developed by um, John Virgin at Caltech and Yuk Yong is going to be using it with the student to actually explore what happens to the Earth over the next century. And in fact, I think, I think they've written up a large uh, fraction of that already, but there's still some work to be done in coupling a, full, a fully interactive biosphere into that model, having the biosphere not just react to climate, but to react back at the climate and affect the climate itself. Um, and finally, on these tasks, we have also active field work at various sites, as I mentioned. Um, this is Janet Seifert's work at Quattro Cienegas, uh, where we are looking at freshwater stromatolites in um, these sort of isolated posas in the Mexican desert, very phosphorus deficient environment. Um, and again, this is work which I think Ariel may have already talked about um, with ASU. Um, Janet works though specifically on horizontal gene transfer, but we're also very much interested in looking the, at the gases that come off these types of life forms and again, try to understand how that might feed into a potential biosignature. Okay, so finally task E, the observer. I'll just go through this very quickly. Uh, in the observer, what we're doing is taking the output from all our previous simulations and trying to understand again what a telescope might see and what a telescope should potentially look for. Um, in addition, in this task, we actually take observations of planets, so that's part of our observational component, um, astronomy field work. Um, and uh, Carl Grillmeyer is on our team too. He's the person who got the highest signal to noise spectrum, an actual spectrum of a Jovian extrasolar planet. And he was able in that spectrum to see a very characteristic signature from the shape of the water band, which is this, this dip and bump here, which I'm showing. Um, that's sort of only the sort of thing a spectroscopist could love, but believe me, that's incredibly exciting. This isn't inferring water just from some photometric band that dropped down, but actually seeing the shape of the band in the spectrum of the planet. So we are making big steps forward in that. So finally, um, wrapping up our EPO project. Um, led by Michael Green, but with buy-in from a lot of our scientists on EPO. Uh, we have five major tasks. We're going to implement um, astrobiology distance learning courses for in-service and pre-service educators. Not going to get to that this year, I don't think, but we will be getting to that next year. Uh, we're interested in entering into a partnership to develop an astrobiology planetarium show where we use the night sky as a context for astrobiological questions and astrobiological education. We're always interested in collaborating with anybody on that one. Um, what we're doing this year are the last three objectives where we're creating an outreach toolkit on astrobiology for the NASA Night Sky Network, which is a network of amateurs right across the country who um, use them amongst themselves and also use them to go out and educate the public as well with star parties and things like that. We're launching public symposia series. We have Frank Drake and uh, Deborah Fisher coming to talk on exoplanets and uh, habitability at the UW uh, this, this quarter, and we'll keep, uh, keep doing that. Um, we're also developing web resources in partnership with JPL's Planet Quest site. And Planet Quest is considered to be one of the better uh, extrasolar planet, in fact, the best extrasolar uh, planet site. So we'll be looking at interactive um, educational modules for that. Just very quickly, the Night Sky Network, as you can see, is pretty widely distributed. And again, it's, it's uh, amateur astronomy clubs that then go out and educate the public. Uh, and the Planet Quest, the world's number one exoplanet website, according to Yahoo, again, working in collaboration with Michael Green uh, at JPL and the Planet Quest website, which is at JPL, uh, working on a bunch of different interactives. We have some ideas for this, including ones that are virtual tours of Europa. So we probably need to collaborate with our IC Moons folks on, on getting that uh, set up. Um, and that is pretty much it. So VPL in a nutshell, science approach, input and output. And I will finish there. Okay, we'll open this up for questions uh, in just a moment. Uh, before we do, let me just make one brief announcement and uh, then make a couple of observations, uh, Vicki, about uh, your talk. The brief announcement is that we have extended the deadline for applications to the Santander Summer School, which is a summer school that NAI and the Centro de Astrobiología have sponsored each year for the last several years in Santander, Spain. The uh, application deadline is now April 24th, and we encourage grad students and postdocs to apply. The NAI provides scholarships, so all your expenses are paid for, and it's a very good experience. This year it's going to be on extremophiles and extraterrestrial habitability, so related to Vicky's talk. And uh, I do encourage you to go to the NAI website, check the latest newsletter. You'll find the announcement of the extension of the deadline and the link to the page that gives you the application information. 
Okay. Now, the comment I wanted to make, Vicki, is that, of course, these talks are in part aimed at developing connections across the Institute, and I just wanted to mention three connections that occurred to me. Uh, your, your team has been extremely good in making connections. Uh, there are three possibly new connections. One is to Melissa Trainer's work. She just gave a uh, seminar at UW last week, so I'm sure you picked up on that. But your team has a lot of the, the theoretical capability to help understand what's actually going on in Melissa's experiment, so I think that would be a really good connection to make. Another is to the work of a postdoc that we just announced a selection in the NASA Postdoctoral Fellow Program uh, in our uh, NAI component of it, and that's Stella Kafka, who's working with Alicia Weinberger at Carnegie. And uh, she is also working on the M-star flare problem and is interested in looking at the correspondence between the astrophysics and the planetary habitability. And so I'd encourage uh, some connections to be made there. And the final thing is that we've been uh, looking with a bunch of folks, including Ariel and Roger and Doug Irwin and, uh, and Peter Ward, uh, as you probably know, at the biogeochemical response of Earth's biosphere to environmental change. And some of the things you mentioned at the end, Yuck Young and uh, the others doing that modeling that you talked about right near the end of your talk, is certainly very germane to that, and Peter can fill you in more on a lot of stuff that's been going on the last few days. So I think there's another very valuable connection. So I'll let you respond, and in the meanwhile, it's open to questions. Just raise your hand in Adobe Connect, and uh, we'll uh, have a chance to uh, interact more with Vicki. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, let's, sorry. Let's let I... respond first. Can I respond? Sorry. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> so, so yes. So thank you um, for all of those suggestions. Yes. Um, yeah, the, uh, Melissa's invitation was no coincidence and uh, to, to come up here. So, yes, we are very, very interested. And we actually talked with her after the talk about chemical models that could potentially help her understand the chain of reactions that, that was going on. But, of course, we also want to better characterize our, our hazes for the methane modeling. So there's, there's a great synergy there. And, yes, we will continue to interact with Melissa. Um, I didn't know about Alicia's postdoc, but that's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very... We, we do have a very much M-star kind of centric uh, interest at the moment, and so we very much like to interact with that, uh, with that postdoc and see if we can help out with anything uh, or let you know the pitfalls of, of what we've tried to do. Um, I'm sorry, I can't... Oh, the third one was the, the um, interaction on life's future habitability, climate. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Peter intimated in an email that was something very interesting he wanted to talk to me about, but I didn't get any details, and I'm guessing that's it. So when he gets back in town, I will, I will talk to him. So thank you very much for all of those suggestions. <coughs> okay, Penn State had a question. Yeah, Becky McCauley here from Penn State. Um, I was curious about what fraction of an extrasolar planet's orbit you'd actually be able to look at and like what that means for your temporal analysis of the spectra. The, um, well, again, that, of course, that depends on your, on your telescope overall. Um, but uh, the general feeling is that once we actually, so if I'm saying, for example, for TPF, which where I've, I know we've looked at the, um, the actual detectability as a function of phase, uh, if we have one of these things, we are going to hammer it to death. So that's, that's, you know, a given that we'll spend as much time as possible on it. But yes, we are limited really to something between dichotomy and uh, the gibbous phase. Uh, there are limits to how close to the star we can go. So we do have limits um, on, for example, on a, on a purely edge-on orbit, how much of that orbit we can potentially see before we're too close to the star, either behind it or in front of it. Um, with orbits that are tilted, we do get a little bit more um, of the phase that we can look at. But overall, yes, there are limitations, and that's part of what we'd like to simulate as well, to say that, look, if you really only got three good months, what could you do with that, you know, versus being able to track it through an entire year? Does anybody else have a question for Vicky? <laughs> uh, my name is Prashanta from Montana State University. And my question is, is, in the first part of your uh, talk, you're talking of developing a model which tries to, you know, talk about where it's likely to be life, but you kind of take, took into account of uh, not to commit the fallacy of, you know, positive and uh, false positive. But what about committing false negatives? 
That means the model says there is no life, but there is life actually. Right. Well, and in fact, probably false negatives are going to be more likely than false positives, I would imagine, in, in that we don't know the full extent of life elsewhere. Um, what you can try to do is build more generalized rules, like these rules of chemical disequilibrium, where, where you really are looking for active sources and sinks. And, and that is something that is independent of any preconceptions you might have about um, you know, what life should be doing in that environment. Um, but if you, if you go down that route, then you really do have to have a very well characterized environment to be able to pick up this chemical disequilibrium signature. And you also have to be able to rule out um, the possibility that that could be created by something other than, than life, like volcanism or whatever. So I think when we find life, I mean, you've targeted one of the problems, is that it really is going to be a probabilistic measurement. We're going to say, okay, we found these characteristics, we've done everything we can to, um, you know, to say whether these could be created by something else, uh, and then we'll come to a probability. But then that doesn't address, you know, how ignorant we might be of, of what life could potentially, what different types of life could potentially do to the environment. And so that's your false negative uh, problem. So I think the best we can do now is just try and work with, you know, the, the available information that we have, but keep in the back of our minds you're exactly right that we may just miss it. We may just, you know, have, have, have no concept of what that type of life would do to its environment. We can only really look for the life we have some clue or some idea um, might be out there. Are there any other questions for Vicki? I'll give you a moment to think of one by mentioning something I should have mentioned. That is that your colleague at UW, John Barros, is one of the lecturers at the Santander Summer School this year, as is Mike Madigan, who is the senior author on the continuation of Brock's microbiology, which is a, a great book if uh, any of you are not by any chance familiar with it. And then Ricardo Emiles and David Gilichinsky are uh, likely going to be the two European lecturers. So it will be a great experience, third week in June. Yeah, Any questions? Alan Boss? Alan Boss from Carnegie has a question. Please, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, yeah, Vicky, I've got a really wacky question for you. I've been giving a lot of public talks lately about what the TPF could it. or could not do. And yeah. uh, occasionally people, people, people ask me, uh, suppose uh, we're talking about looking for life which is not based on carbon, based on silicon or something like that. Have you ever thought about what a silicon-based life form might do in terms of what TPF could find? Um, I, I think the most, the most likely, people think the most, here's a wacky answer, people think the most likely silicon-based life form is probably a robotic race, in which case I guess we're looking for Dyson spheres and technology. Um, I, I think, except of course by the time they get to that point they probably don't need a Dyson sphere. Uh, I think, uh, you know, from arguments with, with colleagues in chemistry, I mean we still think that silicon is, is a far less probable um, basis for life. Again, if Steve Bennett wants to leap in, he can, but... Um, I, I think we're still stuck on the carbon-based, water-based. It just really makes more chemical sense than, than silicon overall. But again, the, the argument is that eventually our organic race may evolve to be silicon-based. We will replace ourselves with electronic components, uh, and therefore we will be, you know, less... Um, our, our habitable zone will in increase, potentially, and um, that is probably the type of silicon-based life we're most likely to see. But the real basic question is, I suppose, if to the extent that people have considered silicon-based life at all, what would be the, the uh, byproducts of silicon-based uh, uh, metabolism? What, what would you end up with, silicon dioxide? You know, what role would it be? <laughs> I have no idea, Alan. I'll answer that honestly. I've got no idea what's going to come out of the, the, the reactions. Alan, take a look at the, the so-called weird life report, the limits of, uh, of life in organic systems that the NRC put out a couple of years ago. And again, John Barros uh, mm -hmm. was the, the chairman of that group. Basically, what they argue is that you're not going to get silicon-based life in water simply because the silicon molecules aren't stable in water. However, you could get silicon-based life if you were looking at a different solvent. And so to the degree that Vicky is focused on planets that contain water, silicon-based life probably isn't all that much of an issue. But if you start looking at more diverse planets where you have formamid or something else, I forget which solvents they suggested could support silicon-based chemistry, uh, then you start getting into, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the more scientific speculation about your question. Thanks for taking it more seriously than it deserved to be taken. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if John was here, I'm sure he could give you a better answer. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, the, the folks who did the Weird Life Report actually took it that seriously, so we might as well piggyback on their enthusiasm for that. So are there any other questions for Vicki? Penn State. Uh, one, one Penn State. Question. Goddard. Oh, Goddard. Uh, Vicki, uh, hi. It's Mike. Uh, uh, I was stunned by the breadth and uh, apparent depth of the work uh, your team is doing. Um, you went through much of it very rapidly, but I came away with the overall impression that you have hundreds of people <laughs> involved in these various activities. <laughs> hundreds. And I, I can't imagine how you can keep all this straight, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I thought my team was big, but yours is phenomenal. What, what, can you just give us the secrets uh, that, you, <laughs> that you have for keeping um, Jim Casting in line, who I see there in the Penn State? Front, oh, that's front easy. There, you know, and others. What's um, well, it, it, it is a very large team, but, you know, um, yeah, I do, I do have to keep, you know, uh, tabs on a lot of different people and in fact it was quite stressful putting this presentation together just trying to draw everything in and, and try and coalesce it into something that would fit within an hour um, but we we have regular team meetings um, you know once every two weeks or so uh, we have an email exploder where a lot of people interact uh, and we co of course have secondary relationships where people are members of the team but they collaborate with another task lead and so you know I don't necessarily have to keep track of everybody um, but yeah, I, I just we just get people involved in this. I have to say, I also have some spectacularly productive postdocs, so it looks like the work of ten people, but it's only the work of one. Um, and and so you know, I, I really I really can't give this an answer other than the fact that we do hang together very well as a team. We have a lot of interactions, um, and so I do get to keep abreast of what people are doing uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and no. keeping Jim Casting in line is really not a problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Jim is about to leap in here because he has the next question. But no, we've had a, we've had a fabulous relationship with Penn State, and that's that's part of what helps keep us together too. Sure. Jim and his postdocs and grads are, are what you're seeing uh, producing a lot of this stuff here as well. So, very, very productive collaborators and a very you know integrated team. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Vicki. Actually, I think what keeps many of us coming back is that if you have any kind of question related to exoplanets and life detection, you can usually get it answered on the VPA, VPL email responder <laughs> expander within about the three hours or less. What, one comment yeah. that I did want to make, uh, Vicki, was in, in respect to this question of alien life and biosignatures, Life may be very alien, but thermodynamics is universal. And so, you know, I agree with Carl. I thought you gave a good answer to the silicon life question. But if you have carbon-based life that's maybe totally different from, you know, ours, not DNA or RNA, but something different, I think you're still going to end up with the same types of byproducts of metabolism that you get here on Earth just because certain things are thermodynamically favored and, and organisms can make a living. So there is, you know, some more general justification to that. I, I agree. One of the uh, things I'd mention in response to uh, Mike's observation is that Vicki uses the technology that we are using right now, namely uh, the ability to use the multipoint control unit that's providing this very nice picture that you're all looking at now and seeing everybody's smiling faces and Adobe Connect and all of that. So I just mentioned that to encourage everybody to consider using this uh, in any way as you manage your teams and your research. It's available to all of you. Uh, we can train your IT folks on uh, how to use it, but basically there's a web interface and this technology is available to all of you, so any of you can be running a meeting like this one. And I know Vicki has been using that as uh, one of her tools. So are there any other questions for Vicki? Yes, I have a question from Colorado. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Vicki, this is Catherine Wright from Colorado. You were talking about modeling planets with liquid water on the surface, and I wanted to ask, since it's quite possible for a planet to be habitable without liquid water on the surface, if there's water underground, were they also modeling that type of planet? Um, I guess the answer is not yet. Uh, the, the, I mean, our, our concern with liquid water on its surface, and I know this is, this is a hot-button issue in the astrobiology community, that this, this uh, discrimination between surface and subsurface life. 
Um, we stick to surface life just because it's more detectable over very large distances. It, it is harder with subsurface life um, to detect, for example, any surface features from it. The gases may get released in, and get up into the atmosphere, um, and, and that may be significant on a planet with a lot of geothermal activity. But if you're looking at, you know, um, photosynthetically driven liquid water life, then you really need to be on the surface, obviously, to get the kind of biomass and the kind of output that we're more likely to detect. So I, I think first off the bat, when these missions are going to be struggling desperately to get enough photons from these planets, that we do tend to have this bias that we want the life to be on the surface. Um, just because it's easier to detect, it's more likely to have eventually gotten photosynthesis and so be a highly productive biosphere as well. Um, so that's kind of our bias at the moment. But, you know, if... if if, if it's possible that subsurface life can release enough things, is inefficient enough that it releases enough stuff into the atmosphere. I mean, most, uh, most areas where resources are limited, you do tend to get this efficiency where, you know, in a microbial mat, you don't let anything out the top if you can possibly avoid it. You know, somebody usually evolves to, to use it. Um, so in that case, this would have to be sort of a release from the biosphere into the surface environment, and we just think that, that maybe that's less likely or more difficult to see, but... Those are our biases at the moment. Any other questions? Okay, let me just announce, uh, mention that the seminar on Wednesday of this week will be by Mike Muma for the Goddard team, same time, same channel. Uh, look forward to seeing you then, and let's thank our speaker again. Talk to you Wednesday. Bye-bye.